Hello and welcome to Performance Check. My name is Rob and once again <laughs> a disastrous start to the stream. Uh, is it working? <laughs> it looks like it's working. Um, for those uh, returning, welcome back. For those joining for the first time, hello. My name is Rob, as I just mentioned, and I am going to be spending this Twitch stream continuing the tale that I began in the first story teller stream. Um, I will do a very brief recap about that shortly, but to begin with, I'm going to start as I did last time by opening a nice beer. Brew dog once again. Cheers. Friday night. Uh, I should have really researched. Last time I was I spoke about how Brew Dog, at least I'm pretty sure Brew Dog, they plant trees. They plant trees whenever you buy their beer, and they also donate money to dog shelters so they plant trees and save dogs so what a better cause to support cheers what do the tabletop terror boys say Slancher Simpson Mackay 2112 it says yes I love it give me more why are we here because we're here roll the bones Love that background. Thank you very much, Simpson Mackay 2112. Simpson Mackay uh, 2112 uh, goes by another name. He goes by many names. Um, there are some who call him Tim, but most of us just call him Craig. And Craig is the player that played Carlos Ungerleider in this merry tale. Um, cleavage is this your only fans and right on cue <laughs> uh, that is Matt who uh, is also a, uh, a player in the home game uh, of which uh, many tales will be told upon this channel uh, and of which you'll be hearing a lot more of in the not too distant future. Yes, I do actually realise that my shirt is incredibly unbuttoned. Unseasonably so. I'm just going to leave it. That's a flex. <laughs> actually, because the way I'm sat here, it does just look like it's undone. So I will. I'll do one. There we go. Got to keep them guessing. Goodness me. What a start. Well, thank you very much for dropping in, boys. Uh, the home crew right there. So... Uh, as I mentioned before with this stream, uh, there, sometimes there will be things on the screen for you to look at, and when that is the case, I will give you a heads up. But as I mentioned last time, uh, I won't be offended if you have this stream on in the background whilst you're doing something else. I love listening to these kinds of streams whilst I play video games. At the moment, I'm still playing Elden Ring. Um, and I enjoy listening to things whilst I grind away and die constantly upon that magnificent game. Uh, but we're not here to talk about video games, we're here to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so let's get going. Uh, last time I began, I know I keep talking about last time, but uh, I, I want to stick to a formula. <laughs> um, previously, I began with a reading, um, and I'm going to do something similar. Uh, however, this won't be like fiction that I have written. It's going to be the, something that someone else wrote. It's going to be the background material that was provided to me before Beyond the Veil, before the campaign began, because I thought it would be interesting, considering I want to talk about the prepping of Dungeons and Dragons and prepping D&D campaigns and like, I thought it would be interesting to introduce at least my thought process when it comes to running a game. And hopefully that'll be interesting. So what what I'm going to read is what Mike, who plays Alden Remmelstein, the Factotum, 
I'm going to read what he gave to me from the get-go um, to introduce his character, basically to give me flavour. And he said to use as much or as little of this in the game that I, I wanted. So hopefully I have it in the right place. And we will begin. Uh, and it comes with a tagline. Alden Remmelstein seeks Ergamax, the final judgment. Alden was a son of the Remmelstein family, a noble house on the east coast of Mainrealm. He lived a generally comfortable life, being able to afford the luxuries of academic pursuit without having to worry about looking for funds and finances. His parents left the estate to his brother Rand before they went to Lockthorn to retire and agreed Alden uh, could still live on and benefit from the estate without working for the family business so long as he continued his academic studies and made something of himself. Uh, Alden originally focused in the study of warfare across the races uh, but spent a lot of time exploring the mythology of Ming Realm and the wider world. Uh, he never really questioned Rand, his older brother's work. The Remmelsteins made money in transport, and he knew Rand specifically focused in uh, the nautical division, great seafaring ships that would uh, sail off onto the horizon. And generally, he left that to him. Typically, he didn't engage uh, his interests long enough in that to warrant taking notice of what was going on. That is, until his brother got into trouble dealing with a criminal network, and suddenly Rand wanted out. His nautical shipping saw a gradual loss of money, and so Ran, Rand had started to make bargains with criminals to manage the illegal trade of narcotics across Main Realm, and possibly beyond. Alden couldn't condone his brother's dealings, but knew he had to help him to get him out of this situation. Alden wouldn't have been able to stand against an entire criminal network single-handedly, and he knew Rand uh, couldn't leave, so instead he resorted to his great knowledge that he'd learned from his studies and from books and the like. Uh, he pulled over tomes and scrolls and learned of a ritual to call forth an extra-planarial being. Alden figured he could summon a powerful creature who he could use to dismantle the criminal network in his stead. The ritual brought into this dimension a dark shade. Alden was never sure what the being was, but true enough to the ritual, the creature set off and disbanded the criminal network in its entirety. It systematically killed off every member, freeing his brother from the, his brother from the criminal's clutches. Along with the indirect guilt, it came with an unfortunate price. The Shade demanded Alden's soul as payment for its service. Panicking, Alden began to bargain with the Shade and only managed to delay the payment. Doing so, whatever, whether the Shade had an ulterior motive or not is still up for debate. Uh, the Shade left his mark on Alden, a black talon burned into his flesh with a warning that he will be back to claim his soul in 18 months. Having got himself some, having given himself some time, he chased through his books and stories and came upon the legend of Ergamax, the final judgment, uh, which was last believed to have been seen across the sea in a land known as Verillion. This weapon, uh, a weapon of this magnitude, might just be enough to help defend him and his soul against the shade. And now we cut to uh, where we last were, and uh, by the time he'd arrived in Valerillion, that only leaves him ten months, because it took a very long time for him to, to get here. Uh, so that was what I was given. Uh, Mike, uh, playing a factotum, who is always in pursuit of knowledge, uh, it's kind of a uh, a very Faustian kind of um, Faustian kind of dilemma, which I thought was pretty interesting and quite a cool idea for the for a D and D character. Um, and there's a lot of room to explore that. Mm. 
So anyway, with that in mind, we're going to jump back because there's something that I forgot to mention last time. They had arrived in Sky Cleave, which is a great vault of ancient elven knowledge. And within, there was an archive, a library. Now, I explained very briefly that they ran into a mimic, <laughs> and that absolutely happened. But while they were in there, they also were able to do some research, which was kind of the whole reason why they're in there, and I sort of forgot to mention it. But they discovered a few things whilst they were inside this library. Uh, if I could hopefully find it. As I mentioned before, my notes are all over the place. So let's just see. Skycleave, here we are. So in the archive, um, they decide to look up a few things. They have the, the vast map that they had received when they first arrived in Main Realm, which I, uh, in Veyridian, sorry, which I will bring up now. Here we are. Uh, so they had been looking at this uh, long and hard and one of the things that they were very curious about and something they started asking questions about was Magma Valva, which is that uh, large mountain uh, to the north of the map <laughs> with the really big writing that says Magma Valva. Um, and from what they understand, from what they'd discovered from asking around Magma Valva, is indeed a volcano. And they don't know whether it's dormant or active, but they know it's there and they know that it looms uh, across the horizon. And they were interested in discovering more about it. So they decided, as this is an ancient archive of knowledge, to look it up. Uh, and in ancient elven script, they discover writings of this mountain. It actually describes a volcanic metropolis that lies uh, within the mountain itself. Uh, and that the city drinks from the mountain's energy and great powers and great systems are uh, great systems of industry are run by the uh, the power of the mountain. Which they find really interesting because uh, for the most part um, this settlement is, uh, or this uh, colony is kind of bare bones. It's been here for about 100 years. The idea of advanced Magitech technology existing within the heart of this mountain is something that definitely piques their attention. Uh, so they put that on the back burner for the moment. They also look up um, the, uh, the book. They find a book called Beyond the Veil, which is the name of the campaign. Um, and they learn all about how Veyrillion is a bridge from the Prime Plane to other worlds that lie beyond the Veil. And that a great war once raged between the Feywild and the Shadowfell. Uh, two realms, uh, or two worlds, are divided by Veyrillion um, until they were united under the Alliance of Arvindor, a Fey Pact sworn atop Skycleave on neutral soil. It is there revealed to them that the Lord of Autumn was the one to swear this pact and become its keeper. So they learn, uh, as I kind of alluded to last time, that uh, there was an alliance forged between the Feywild and the Shadowfell for a time. Usually sworn enemies, but uh, something, some great conflict, uh, forced the two uh, ever-warring factions of the Fey to... Um, to forge an alliance uh, and uh, they continue reading on and they learn that there is a great tablet that this alliance the, the alliance of Arvindor was kind of like signed upon as it were and it was put into stone <clears throat> they also have picked up on other bits of information whilst they were moving through Skycleave because this is an uh, a a vault of ancient elven knowledge. There's quite a lot of mentions of a goddess known as Corallon, a goddess of the elves. Uh, they don't learn much more about her than uh, what you would imagine. 
um, basics about what her domains are and they, the main thing that they really learn about her is that she's no more attentive to her people than the wind would be uh, she is effectively like a hardcore nature goddess and doesn't really care if you live or not which is uh, you know fair, fair enough fair enough uh, Bubacus says, hello, hello, welcome. How it do, what it be? I'm not sure. Let's find out together. Uh, so that's what they uh, learned from the uh, the archive. Oh, they found out one more thing. They, found, they discovered uh, information about the myths of the elven genesis, that it's called. Uh, and they learned that all elf kind were banished from Arvindor. First they arrived in the Feywild, where the Eladrin flourished. Then the drow were tempted, and the elves fled. The Eladrin vowed to help the elves build and prosper on the Prime Plain, wanting the bridge between the Feywild and the Shadowfelt guarded. So with all of that information, that is what they discovered before they went through the pit, before they um, went up against the Wyvern in the pit. Uh, and since I've been away, I've uh, taken a few screenshots of uh, the Roll20 maps that we were using. Um, so this is one of the early ones, because I, I should let it be known that this was the first time that I've ever run anything on Roll20. Uh, when I've run in person, obviously I've just used dry wipe uh, grids. Um, and when I've run online, in the past, it's always been theatre of the mind over Zoom or Google Hangouts or things where you don't necessarily have such a visual component. So I was really trying my best to get to grips with the uh, the tools of Roll20. Anyway, all that to say, this was the first major dungeon that I made. <laughs> and it's a little bare bones. Um, but uh, what I really enjoyed doing was just getting basic, basic uh, stone... Uh, assets are sort of like blocks. Maybe I'll move that there. So all the walls are made of like you know, and I kind of Minecrafted it together to make the the dungeon. So at the very top is where they entered, and that's where they had a great fight with a um, a a battalion, not a battalion, but a big squad of hobgoblins that had an ogre with them. You can still see the fire there, which is uh, an acid that I dropped in when Alden missed with the uh, the ember fire coal. They threw at the creature, missed, and it detonated on the tower that uh, is behind him. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, you can also see sort of like the white marble area that's sort of in the middle on the right hand side. That's where they face the naga. Um, the withered bone naga. Uh, the left hand side of the middle is the archive where they just discovered the information and then you see there's that black pit towards the bottom that's where they ran into the shad archive which if you don't remember are the elves that aren't mentioned in the elven genesis which are the, the elves that uh, somehow ended up in the Feywild and became the subjects of the maddened raven queen who is uh, another goddess that we shall speak of a lot in this in this storytelling stream series. So anyway, yeah, they fought the Wyvern, like I said, and then they made their way up to the very top of the tower where they faced a Shadow Kai Shadow Weaver. And I've forked out a great treat for you uh, this, this fine evening, my dear viewers. I have a large amount of unbound graph paper <laughs> which is what I was using to write down stats because while I like to have all of my prep in a Google Doc when it comes to the actual stats of creatures and NPCs and things that they'll be up against and fighting I just like to have it on a bit of paper in front of me so that I can scribble notes down and I don't have to keep clicking away from Roll20 and stuff. It's just something that, for me, keeps the game speedy. Um, 
and I found this today completely by accident and I couldn't believe it. I was like, well, this will be perfect for the storyteller stream. So we had the Shadow Kai Spellweaver. That's what its name was. And uh, like I mentioned before, they had this insane battle with this creature that was trying to get hold of the tablets that uh, Nekurian, uh, the Lord of Autumn, had, you know, had this pact put upon the Alliance of Arvindor. For some reason, the Shadow Kai want it. Um, and they don't know why, but they decide that they're going to contest this Shadow Kai for this tablet. And the big battle happens at the top of Sky Cleave. Uh, the Spellweaver, or the Shadow Weaver, whichever one I called it, Shadow Kai Spellweaver, it says here, had these sort of like raven like entities that joined him, these made of shadow that attacked the players. And they did this huge fight, and eventually. Uh, they knocked him off the edge of the tower and he tumbled to his demise and the tablet was theirs um, and it was pretty epic it was pretty epic uh, for the first major major dungeon of the campaign um, it was it had a fairly spectacular end to it uh, and the players really did start to sort of flex their, their powers a bit more it was clear to me that Carlas Ungolida Craig's character the samurai was going to be an unstoppable melee character um, the fact totem challenging to make challenges for because uh, Mike had built him in a way where uh, to explain the fact totem effectively has like a version of biotic inspiration um, the fact totem can spend inspiration and can get like inte their intelligence put onto their roles and stuff uh, and their skills and their, and later their saves and all sorts to the point that they can ba basically spend on anything and um, they later get a thing called Arcane Dilettante I think it's Dilettante where they can then learn spells as well and they can learn not just Arcane spells at least I think, oh no it is Arcane Dilettante and then I, I don't know if they get Divine abilities or not. I'll have to ask Mike, I can't remember. It was a little while ago since we played. Um, but anyway, they were victorious. They beat the Shadow Kai. Let's have a look at the notes, because what I keep ending up doing is trying to say this from memory, which I shouldn't be. That's why I have notes. And that is why I shall look upon them now. That's right. So there was a few loose ends in the Sky Cleave, uh, which they had to wrap up. Now, um, I mentioned it very briefly last time that there was a big old pit with a carving of a scorpion <laughs> and they definitely took a mental note of that like we're going to come back to that pit where there was a big scorpion drawing of a scorpion next to it because that's basically the dungeon master saying there's a big scorpion in this pit <laughs> and they weren't wrong there absolutely was they did battle with a great big scorpion uh, a monstrous scorpion um, and it was touch and go for a while they were fighting in the ruins uh, in fact you can see at the top there the top right of the sky cleave map see there's a black spot uh, around there was where the scorpion came out and then all those ruins around it they were sort of like du dancing and ducking between debris and stuff as this uh, gigantic beast was swinging its great sting at them and trying to annihilate them trying to slip them with its uh, with its great pincers and stuff and uh yeah eventually they were successful um and uh they noted that uh when they had a bit more time they were to decipher one of some of these messages around this carving once they defeated the scorpion uh, and Carla seemed particularly bothered by the uh, the emblems and the imagery that, that you know this particular mural had he recognized it uh, he recognized it as belonging to an entity known as Sargoth and um, the other two uh, Alden and Ashbourne they tried to press him for more information and he was like I just know this guy and I know uh, I, I fought against his faction, uh, the Scorpion Clan. And they were like, "Oh, this is linked to to, to you in some way." And he's like, "Absolutely, it is why I'm here in this in this realm." Um, and this really took them aback. They they were very surprised by this, um, and 
that's all that they really pressed him for. They were like, listen, we're still in a very dangerous situation. We're still uh, in unknown territory. We'll talk about this when we're out of here. And he's like, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about when we're out of here. But And suddenly they hear something. They hear something coming from near the entrance, the great the cave uh, network that they've gone through, which is the, the left top left part of the map there. Uh, and the other loose end that they hadn't dealt with is that they knew that there were other adventurers in Skycleave. Um, they had arrived and they discovered the body of a dead adventurer who was in the entrance of the cave. Uh, they had to go through a cave to even try and get into the into Skycleave. Um, and uh, yeah, they 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 sort of like they, I'm not going to say they'd forgotten about it, but they'd. Uh, They'd, they'd had a lot of stuff on their mind, and the only room that they hadn't explored was it is the um, if you look at the the, fir, the the on the left hand side, where that first entrance is to Skycleave, there's those two black squares, uh, which are like these pit things that were dug into the floor. That is where uh, a, a rival adventuring party had uh, taken up uh, residence. Uh, they'd already betrayed one of their own. Um, who uh, they learned was a, a cartographer who'd hired the others. Um, and he had been hired by uh, an organization known as the Academy, uh, which they recognize as a magical school, uh, which is uh, prominent within the kingdoms of the Dominion. Uh, and he had a half finished map on him, uh, which um, was not of this place. It was uh, titled The Shrine of Solothon. They didn't really know what that meant at the time, so they decided just to keep the map and uh, um, and move on. But now they'd, uh, they'd come back, they'd remembered that there were other people around, uh, and all of a sudden, as they were trying to get out of this place, that's when the rest of these adventurers were upon them. Uh, let's see. I do you think I had written down what they were called? Oh, at least I thought I had. That's a shame. Oh no, it's here! <laughs> I have them on this big sheaf of grid paper. I'm pretty sure. I'm fairly sure I saw them. Here we are. So there was... Velpa and Maurice. Maurice was a terrifying half orc. Oh, sorry, and growled. <laughs> I don't know who growled was. Um, oh, but he has sneak attack written on his stats, so I'm guessing he was a rogue. So Maurice and growled, uh, human, rogue, ha um, half orc, barbarian with a great axe, were suddenly upon them. And they had a desperate battle in these caves on their way out of Skycleave. Then. As they dispatched them, they noticed a third individual, a female spellcaster, uh, fired a spell at the uh, at sort of one of the caves and wrecked the entrance, caused like a cave in, and rocks fell. <laughs> rocks fell, and their path was blocked. And while I was like, "You'll be able to get out. It's just going to take you a little while to to." to get through. She had done this to buy us some time to escape, which they were not happy about at all. Um, but for the most part, they considered their uh, their foray to Sky Cleave a success. They had left with a tablet uh, with the carving of the Alliance of Arvindor upon it. Um, they had got lots of cool loot, um, including a ring that you could put a spell into and then cast at will. So even if you're a spellcaster, you can have a spellcaster put a spell in this ring, so like a fireball, and then you suddenly have the um, the fireball that you can activate at your discretion. And all sorts of other stuff. They found some weapons and stuff like that. Uh, but speaking of weapons, Alden uh, had, uh, had been doing a bit of uh, research in the archive as they were talking about everything else they discovered. And there's something else that I forgot to mention that they found in that archive. They found a lot in that archive, my goodness me. Um, 
Alden was looking up any traces of a weapon known as Ergamax, also known as the Final Judgment. And they were, the other two were like, what's that all about? And he said, well, I, uh, I'll explain when I'm out. And then they're out, so he starts explaining. <laughs> uh, the Final Judgment is the weapon that he has been seeking to help defend himself against the extraplanarial threat that he owes a debt to. Uh, and Alden believes uh, wholeheartedly it's like there's something within him that is telling him that he needs this weapon. And he has defied all other reason, all other logic. He has leapt upon this boat and he has crossed the sea to find Ergamax's legendary blade. And the, uh, the writings in the archive tell him that this legendary blade is buried beneath landfall itself, the great colony city um, of Verilium. And it's located in a place called the Tomb of the Founders. Um, and they're very excited about this, like, oh, that sounds cool, that sounds like a place we would like to visit. Uh, so they each agree that they're actually enjoying it, because, you know, they'd spent a bit of time together on the ship, and it was sort of up for debate whether they were going to spend, narratively, they were going to keep spending time with each other, but after this old deal, and the fact that they have discovered, like, a new place to explore together, like, let's stick together. Um, and it's then that Ashbourne says, well, seeing as we're sticking together, I wouldn't mind checking out the Circle of Shepherds, which was the Druidic order that Zakasa, who was the prisoner of the Denark family, had told them about. Zakasa, just to remind you very quickly, was a half-elf druid who had been captured and was forced to use his druid druidic abilities to help grow uh, Knave's Leaf, which is a type of drug. And uh, <laughs> they had freed him, and in return, he'd like offered this information. He says, "I am in your debt. If you, even though I'm an exile of that order, um, because I'm good at using it to grow drugs to then sell, um, I should say that Zakasa were left the order to grow drugs on his own, and then the Denark family took note of his enterprise and decided to just." kidnap him and take so they could then you know profit from that anyway all that to say you're that you'll be uh you're i'm indebted to you and they will repay you they they will uh they will help you in some way the uh ashbourne had explained that he was in verilian because he um is on pilgrimage which for his Dru druidic order which definitely isn't a cult uh, is like sort of like a rite of passage uh, to bear some mantle or to 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 do some service uh, for nature is sort of like his goal um, but it's a kind of loosey goosey goal you know so <laughs> he's just out here in the new world looking for something to uh, to put his uh, to put his course to which is pretty great god I need a drink ugh Dear me, I hope everyone's having a lovely evening or a lovely time doing whatever it is that you're doing when you listen to this. So yeah, Skycleave was a success. And I will put that away now. Um, as they are journeying, I shall bring the map of uh, the Iridium back up. So the journey, and you see Sky of Cleave, it's uh, east of Landfall. Instead of journeying back to Landfall, they decide to head south. And they do this to find the Circle of Shepherds, which is that circle of pillars to the south of Sky Cleave. Pardon me, goodness me. Um, and on the way, Ashbourne, the druid, explains that he needs to perform a ritual. And they say, well, what kind of ritual, Ashbourne? He says, well, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm without an animal companion. During their voyage, 
Ashbourne's animal companion had been an octopus that had swum alongside the boat. And that is just a detail that I just decided to skip over <laughs> during the last stream because it's a lot of information to give at the very beginning. It's a lot of information to give about this whole game, to be fair, but there we are. Um, yeah, so there, he had an animal companion, and it was an octopus, and he decided to dismiss it because he'd arrived in the new world after being on this boat for months. He's like, I'm going to be on land now, Mr. Octopus. And I just really think it's better if you and I go our separate ways. It was fun whilst it lasted. It's not you, it's me. Whatever cliche that you would like to hold close to make you feel all right in the end. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with that. Uh, he says, yes, I need, to, I, need to, I need to do a ritual to summon a new animal companion. And I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting. Like, well, how, how, do you, how do you do that? And, and Ashbourne says, well, I need to go into the forests. And luckily, as we head south towards the, uh, the circle of shepherds, there, there is plenty of forest to do this in. Um, I'm going to find a particular kind of mushroom. And I'm going to make a concoction. And uh, I'm going to... I'm going to trip balls. And they're like, oh, <laughs> really? And he's like, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna trip balls, and I'm going to <laughs> during that process find my animal companion. And they're like, okay, well, do you need anything from us? No, no, no. Just whenever we rest next, hopefully soon. I'm knackered after that great big uh, adventure in that dungeon. When we rest, I will I will perform the right then, and I will spend the night doing that. And you guys just look after yourselves. I'll be fine. And they say, okay. So Ashbourne does this. He makes this concoction. He takes these roots. He gathers materials together. He performs a, uh, a, a good survival check, I think, and a good nature check to make sure he gets the right materials. And then he, <laughs> he steams this concoction, which I think he inhales, drinks, and then snorts. <laughs> snorts like the dregs. Uh, and then... <laughs> Uh, and then all of a sudden he is out of his mind. He is out of his mind. He like rips away his clothes and just dashes <laughs> into the woods. And the other two, Alden and Carlos, are like, he said he was going to be fine, right? Is he going to be fine? Is he going to be fine? I don't know. I don't know. But it is funny. Uh, cut to Ashbourne. And I say, listen, <laughs> uh, you are experiencing a psychedelic experience. Uh, you see a kaleidoscope of perfectly fitting images rolling about in front of you that are forming uh, the very truths of nature before your very eyes. Like It's almost like you are being embraced by something else um, from... Uh, the, within the world itself um, and uh, you feel a presence approaching you but there's a dark presence it is a skulking presence uh, you have to remember uh, I remember Corallon the, uh, the goddess of the elves uh, while the elves hail her uh, she is nature incarnate and, and does not care for your life uh, nature is cruel uh, and that is something that you will always remember now because your animal companion is a dire weasel <laughs> and I think he rolled for it he rolled for it and it came up dire weasel and he was like oh <laughs> it was uh, you know he thought it was going to be it was going to be like a I don't know like a I don't know like a wolf or a stag or a, a hawk or an owl. No. This terrifying, massive, dire weasel with eyes empty. <laughs> as I describe it. Empty as the void. The void uh, sort of approaches out of the darkness while you're tripping balls. And <laughs> uh, and Ashbourne has this entire experience where he sort of like is face to face with 
with this terror, this this individual that has like shark eyes, <laughs> but it's a, but it's a dire weasel. It just if you look at a shark's eyes, you just don't see anything, do you? That's sort of what he's going through. Um, and like he holds out a hand, but this dire weasel is just stubbornly staring at him for a moment, <laughs> and then we just hard cut to morning, and the Carlos and Alden are sort of like finishing up their breakfast. So like we wonder where wonder where Ashbourne is. It's been <laughs> it's been all night and Weir's like worried. He ran off naked into the forest. And he comes back and he's just covered in like cuts from running through brambles and being lashed by branches and stuff. And like, oh my god, you're bad. We were worried sick and he's <laughs> they, they see this fucking excuse my language. This monster with him. This dire weasel which is almost up to his waist. He's like, I'd like to introduce you to Me Ooh, Snagtooth. I almost called him Menace, which was another weasel in a different story. Snagtooth, the dire weasel. And they looked at him and they were like, oh my God, <laughs> this you have a dangerous animal with you. Yet, whenever Ashbourne moves, whenever Ashbourne directs this animal, it, it compl it's completely obedient to him and uh, appears to be sort of like devoted to him. Um, and that is how Ash got his animal companion and it was a dire weasel which turned out to be an excellent choice. Uh, the Bob's tits. Uh, speak of the devil himself, Ashbourne Bryant in the chat says, I love how we did Ash's drug trip uh, companion. Well, there he is, the man himself. Um, you can remind me, actually, Dom, if you're still listening. What did we roll for the dire weasel, or did you choose him? I can't remember. Either way, an excellent choice for an animal companion. Uh, one that I would never have considered, but one that is entirely lethal <laughs> uh, and entirely difficult to field enemies against in a in, in a combat situation. Anyway, we rolled, Dom says. I thought we did. Uh, and I think at the time we were we were kind of... Oh. <laughs> okay. And then we looked at it and it was like, oh my God, this creature is insane. And you'll learn what he can do soon enough. Uh, let's look at the notes because I need to check what actually happens next. They're on their way to the Circle of Shepherds. Um... Let's see. The circle of shepherds. So, uh, the circle of shepherds, also known as the Adelin, a circle of druidic elves, are uh, currently holding council um, in Verilion. Obviously, they're in Verilion. So, I'm just to let you know, uh, I'm reading from my notes right now. Um, a circle of druidic elves hold council. They are led by Beda. Uh, now, they arrive and are kind of witnessing this council, and uh, these elves are sort of uh, stood in this circle. Great big pillars of rock. Um, kind of like a sort of like a big stone, Stonehenge is big. I've been recently but a bigger version of Stonehenge, or as Stonehenge as it would have been. Um, and they appear to be holding this council and talking to something that is obscured by the great rocks uh, in front of them. And they arrive and they say, we're here to speak uh, with Beda, at least Ashbourne, I think, says. Um, he is, um, we, we, I've sought to, um, to speak with you. I am Ashbourne, I am a druid from uh, the from main realm across the sea um, I'm not sure how we determined which realm Ashborn was from in main realm I think he probably doesn't even know because <laughs> he's just this wild guy that lives in the uh, lives in the great outdoors with definitely not a cult um, uh, so he probably doesn't know but he says I'm from main realm I've travelled far across the sea to uh, uh, as a pilgrimage from my kind um I'm here to uh, to commune with you and uh, and to learn from you, if it uh, if it pleases you, and then all of a sudden, 
they learn what the uh, the Adelin were speaking to. They they expected another another elf, uh, but what they actually see is a giant shadow move behind uh, one of the great rocks, and then suddenly leaping down from on high, uh, there is a giant panther. Uh, Beda is a druid that has uh, remained in wild shape, has chosen to become part of nature rather than uh, retain his elven form. He became a panther, because why wouldn't you, right? <laughs> why wouldn't you want to be a big panther? And he's big. He's a big boy. <laughs> is our beta. He's a big boy. He uh, is massive, and he prowls about them saying... Um, uh, you know, our ways are very secretive, and uh, while we do welcome travellers, we do not offer our teaching so easily. And they're like, "Oh my God, this this beast is giant, giant." It's not giant. I think it was huge, but huge, yeah, huge category. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway. Uh, Beda a druid uh, who is uh, fully aligned with wild shape and uh, remains in the form of a giant panther uh, he explains to them uh, they sort of like catch up with what's going on in the realm and they, they sort of tell Beda about their 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 journey from landfall and their journey into Skycleave um, and the name Nikurian pops up twice because not only is Nikurian the one who was who came and laid claim to landfall and uh, a big fight erupted with him in the middle of the city they also learned the same individual, uh, this ancient Aladrin, is responsible for this alliance being forged in um, in Skycleave. Uh, and Beda looks upon them darkly when they mention Nikurian, and he says, oh, I know Nikurian well. He seeks our fealty. Um, he welcomes anyone who would honour nature, but if anyone refuses his call, he considers them traitors to his cause. Um... He has sent Maradime, a trusted servant, another Eladrin, who lies in wait nearby. Uh, and her and the forces of the Eversworn, those elite Eladrin forces that came with Nikurian, well, they, they, they are encamped nearby and they pressure us. They want us on side uh, for whatever they have planned for, the, uh, for humanity um, in this world, in this, uh, in this land. Like, oh, psh, my God, that's bad news. That is bad news. We've seen this guy fight, and we know that those Aladrim were hardcore. They have seen with their waking eyes that these guys, 20 of them, uh, fought against a massive force of uh, militia in the city when they'd been completely outnumbered. Uh, just imagine, like, a cre an entity that has lived thousands of years... I'm going to devote those thousands of years to training. Like, how good would each one of those those entities be in a fight? Um, and yeah, they uh, they sort of like are back and forth at this at the time because uh, Beda doesn't have anything particularly against Nikurian. Nikurian, um, well, he doesn't right now. <laughs> well, I'll go into that in a moment. Uh, but he, he doesn't like, he doesn't want to, uh, he doesn't want to be at war with humanity, and he definitely doesn't want to help Nikirian hurt other people. They are peaceful creatures. They're peaceful, uh, peaceful druids. Nikirian isn't peaceful. Anyway, all that to say that the Outlanders say, well, listen, we are more than happy. We are more than happy to embark to find this encampment of these ever sworn and speak with this maradime and tell them to ease the pressure off a little bit if you're peaceful then then they have no reason to threaten you and perhaps then that will earn Ashbourne the right to some of your secrets and they were like uh, and and the Adelum, the circle of shepherds agree they said well but you by all means but please do not endanger yourself these are very, very <laughs> formidable warriors. Be careful. They're like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, and uh, off they go. I'll go have a quick drink. It sounds to me I'm not the only person drinking this evening. 
Simpson Mackay. 2 1 1 2. I am currently in the Golden Cross toilets. <laughs> and I love this. Feed me more. Have a bev on me. I look forward. <laughs> Why are we here? Because we're here. Roll the bones. Roll the bones. Uh, that is Carlos Angelida. Uh, Craig enjoying himself in the Golden Cross, one of our favourite drinking spots um, in the whole world. And while he's out there enjoying himself, I'm in here enjoying myself. <laughs> Talking about D and D online, and I wouldn't change it for a moment. Let's see, what are we doing? What are we doing? So yeah, they they agree to confront the Eversworn. I well, <laughs> the like I said, the Circle of Shepherds say, don't confront them. If you have to speak with them, speak with them, but just be careful. Don't get in a fight with them. <laughs> They're like, whatever. Off they go. And they don't have to journey far. Um, and Ashbourne is particularly good with nature, as I mentioned, and survival. So he's able to locate the position fairly quickly. He's quite good at tracking. They move their way through the uh, through the wilderness. And suddenly, I have this as well. Screenshotted from Roll20. I was amazed I still had all these maps, actually. I'm very pleased that I kept them for the... Uh, so I could show you them today. Let's see. The Circle of Shepherds. Oh, I haven't shown you the actual Circle of Shepherds. So that is the map that I used there. I wish I could credit the artist's name. Uh, I did buy this work, but um, I can't remember his name, unfortunately, but it's a beautiful piece. Uh, and uh, I should explain this. So those stone, uh, those stone pillars there surround that a great fey tree. Uh, which is another one of those trees that that grow from the Feywild and uh, bloom in the material plane, in the prime plane. So there we are. That's where they are. And look, there's uh, you can see in the bottom corner. There's the uh, the Outlanders with Snagtooth, <laughs> the Dire Weasel, now in tow. So anyway, off they go. Off they go to see the Eversworn, uh, and they're looking for this Maradime, who is the um, who is like a a lieutenant of Nicurian. And it doesn't take them long; they eventually find the Eversworn camp, and uh, it doesn't look exactly like this. Those figures all grouped together in the middle weren't exactly grouped up like that, but. They noted that there were a significant amount of them. Let's see. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, probably. Because there's one dead in the corner. The reason why there's one dead in the corner is because Carlos Ungolida, the fearless samurai warrior. Uh, how do I move this? There we go. It doesn't really matter, does it? Uh, no, I'll just leave it there. Uh, the fearless samurai warrior, Carlos Angolida, uh, stole his way up the left flank where there was a solitary um, a lantern. And <laughs> he killed him. <laughs> he, uh, he, he just took him out. Um, and uh, that obviously was a problem. Because that didn't go unnoticed by the Alandrin who saw that they were under attack. And quite naturally, they retaliated. <laughs> um, and it's uh, 13 against 4, including the, uh, including the, um, the Dire Weasel, Snagtooth. And a bitter battle erupts. And don't get me wrong, it's not like they're having their ass handed to them, but there's just too many of them. And they are each sort of on a par with them right now. They're not super high level, I should add. Like, uh, like I'm not being deliberately harsh to them or anything and throwing like super powerful enemies at them, but I have warned them. <laughs> many occasions I've said, 
and I've shown them what the other swarm are capable of. Like these guys are insanely good at fighting. You know, I keep saying that, and I shouldn't keep going on about it, but <laughs> pressing the point, I'm setting the fact up. These guys are going to be hard to beat, and they meet them in battle, and the battle doesn't go very well at all. Uh, they are being shot at because the Eladrin are incredible at uh, with, with bows loosing arrow after arrow after arrow whilst others are moving for the kill so not only are they taking constant crossfire damage they also have people in front of them who are just like wailing on them smashing against their defences uh, and basically putting on virtuoso performances with their weaponry um, and they're in trouble but one of their number is not in trouble and that is Snagtooth and I Weasel and we discover <laughs> in fact I'm going to look it up hopefully the this doesn't affect the stream if I'm looking it up just so I make sure I'm right Dire Weasel the Dire Weasel in 3.5 is insane and its attack while fairly savage is nothing in comparison to the special ability it gets when it lands an attack a dire weasel that hits with its bite attack latches onto the opponent's body with its powerful jaws. Uh, an attached dire weasel loses its dexterity bonus to its armor class, and thus, uh, blah, 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 I'll skip that. An attached dire weasel uh, can be struck, blah, blah, blah. To remove attached dire weasel through grappling, the opponent must achieve a pin against the creature. So, not only do you have to, like, deal with this creature, like you've got to like out grapple the uh, effectively what is a grapple expert it's designed <laughs> in the game to be really good at just latching on and not letting go so it's really hard to get it get it off you basically is what i'm trying to say and then when it's on you it's it's other ability kicks in which is blood drain a die weasel drains blood for 1d4 points of constitution damage each round while it remains attached. So effectively, every combat <laughs> in this campaign, uh, I have to worry as a GM that my integral villainous NPCs have to watch out for a vicious, shark-eyed, void-filled, or empty, <laughs> empty soul dire weasel that can just attach to an enemy and drain them until they are dead <laughs> uh, and he does not disappoint in this battle Snagtooth launches through the air attaches to an Aladrin and within a couple of rounds has slain an Aladrin where the others are struggling the Dire Weasel is in its element and as soon as it's dropped one it looks up snarling blood <laughs> covering its muzzle like he just launches into the next one um, and the amount of times that Snagtooth turned the tide of a battle is really unbelievable uh, don't get me wrong there have been other occasions where animal companions and familiars have been really useful in campaigns that I've been involved in player or GM but I don't think I've ever, ever seen one that's been as effective in combat. Like, I've always been worried for animal companions. Oh my god, they're going to die and it's just going to be horrible. And I've seen my fair, fair share of animal companions be killed and it's horrible. I, I don't like it. But that's not to say I was pulling my punches. There was no way I could kill this creature. It was impossible. He was just too good. We severely underestimated the Eversworn. Says the Bob Tits. The Bob's Tits. <laughs> I can't take your username serious. Don't. We severely underestimated the Ever Sworn. Did. But that's it. Like, sometimes, like, you've got to show... This is what's important about the game. Sometimes you've got to... You're not always going to make the right decision, and that's okay. That's fine. You don't have to feel like you have to make the right choice every time. But you just got to understand that where there are mistakes, there are consequences. We have Cole here. Hello, Cole. And she says, uh, they made a choice. It drains blood. Wow, that's a crazy ability. It is. It really is. And considering that, you know, he as a druid, he could just get that, you know. Um, brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. Um, druids are formidable spellcasters. Uh, so to, uh, to have that as well. Yeah. 
but then Cole says, but that's uh, just one Aladrin. There's more waiting. That's absolutely right. Uh, and the mob's tit says, Snagtooth was ruthless. He was. Uh, and while Snagtooth was uh, excellent in that battle, he still can turn the tide to the point where Carlas got brought down. Carlas, who was up in the front, his shining samurai blade in hand, katana, sorry, <laughs> uh, he just gets brought down. And Aladrin parries his strike and just runs him through and drops him. Uh, doesn't kill him, but drops him. It was unbelievable. Couldn't believe it. Carlos Ungolider. Well, I could believe it. <laughs> but it was pretty dramatic. And I think it then dawned on them. They were like, oh, this was a mistake. This was a mistake. Um, however, Maradime, who is the uh, the leader of this Alandrian force, this lieutenant of Nikirian, um, has noted that she is taking losses as well. Like They carve through quite a few of them. And, you know, this is despite them being as good as they are, they still beat a few of them back. And she takes the opportunity to say, We have brought down one of you, we, we have brought down your strongest, she says. Uh, yeah, you have, uh, you have harmed us as well. Uh, lay down your arms, fall back. Uh, and you and you can go with your lives. Fairly reasonable. Uh, there is a back and forth between them whether or not that they keep going and they keep fighting or they retreat. But I think I, I think uh, this might not be correct. But I have a feeling Ashbourne probably would have been the one to have said, "Yeah, this is done. Let's fall back." And Alden would have probably been like, "No, let's keep fighting." Because. <laughs> uh, Mike has a, 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 a bit of a a mad streak in him sometimes where he will fight till he's dead. <laughs> and be like, oh well, I'll make another character. <laughs> uh, I could be wrong. That might not have been it. But as to, from memory, I'm pretty sure that, uh, that Ashbourne was like, let's go. And Alden was like, let's keep going. But they eventually decided, okay, for Carlas, let's, uh, let's withdraw. So, um, they're able to uh, heal Carlas with a potion, or I think uh, maybe maybe Ashbourne had heal at that point. Could he heal people? I can't remember. I think he could. Anyway, they're able to revive him, and they say, "We're going." <laughs> and Carlas is like, "Come on, then!" They're like, "No, no, no, no. We we've we've brought you back so we can fall back. Okay, we we've re revived you so you can we can fall back, not so you can keep fighting. Let's go." Um. And they have like a bit of a standoff with Maradai where it's like, you've not seen the last of us. And she's like, I'm sure. There's more there's more of us in the Adelin, uh, in the uh in the Ainala. There's there's so many more of us. Um the for the Kyrian's forces are just waiting for the time, and that time draws near. And they are reminded about what Nikirian said by the uh, the fall of Autumn's leaves uh, their destruction will be made what did he say There was. A, it sounded better than that <laughs> he uh, just to remind myself what his actual wording was he said something along the lines of you've got until Autumn and then shit is going to hit the fan uh, da -da -da. he said May you set your sails forth and let the eastern wind carry you across the sea from whence you came, for by the fall of the first leaves of autumn I shall reclaim the lands you took from our people. There you go. That's what he said. So that's what rings in their mind. They're like, oh my god. They just So when autumn comes, that's when the Aladrin are going to full force this? They're going to just strike? Uh... So you can't, you know, Nikurian's giving them a chance. <laughs> He's giving humanity a chance. Um, how much of a chance is up for debate? Uh, I'm not saying he's a good guy. He's not. So anyway, they withdraw from this battle with the Eversworn, uh, and uh, they 
you know, they don't feel particularly good with that. I'm pretty sure that that session ended, that the session that time ended there, and it ended on a defeat, and they hadn't, we hadn't ended the session on them being beaten. They, they felt like, oh, we were beaten there. Like, she was the one that said, let's not finish them off. Like, not us. So, yeah. Interesting. So, where did they go after that? I can't remember. So, that's why I look at my notes. That's right. So, um... Uh, so, for some reason, I can't remember why, why they did this. Um, on their way back, because they decide, they said, right, they go back to the um, the circle of shepherds. Do they go back? I will work that out. What I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to take a very short break. I'm going to get myself another drink. And I'm going to work out where we are. So that's quite a good cliffhanger to leave it on for the, just a very short while. Um, but I'll be back shortly where we will continue the Storyteller Stream! Cue the animatic. I said cue the animatic. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I'll be right back. I'll be like two minutes.
And I'm back. Hello. Thank you for your patience. Um, I have another beer, which I am going to open now. Cheers. I'm going to do this. In the hope of imminent sponsorship. No? Fair enough. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great, if, you know, if they were just like, listen, we love planting trees. We love giving money to the dock homes. Let's give money to a obscure, <laughs> to put it kindly, obscure uh, YouTube channel and Twitch channel to uh, to promote our wares. Does it taste like punks? Because you, uh, well, it is a punk IPA. So yeah, I guess. Listen, I like it. It's very nice. But uh, what do you drink, Carl? Let's. Uh, what's we wait for that answer? Let's go back to the story. So. I've worked out where we are. <laughs> I was like, they need to go to the academy. They went to the academy, but why did they go to the academy? And I suddenly realised. Uh, they want to go to the academy, and let's look at that on the map. And there is a reason for this. There's a reason for most things. But there is a very good reason for this. So, uh, the academy is on the very eastern side of landfall it's almost like it's separate area just outside the walls actually on, on that great cove and like I say it's a uh, it's um, a magical school that is funded by the Dominion and this is just one of various schools dotted around the world mainly in main realm but this academy is the well, this is sort of their presence in the new world. And the reason they want to go there is because uh, while Alden was able to get some information about Ergovax, this blade that he wants to use to help defend himself against this extra planarial threat, uh, they don't really know an awful lot about the Tomb of Founders, which uh, was obviously a grave made for the Founders of Landfall, and thus is a much more recent history than what can be found in the unopened archives of the ancient elves. So they're like, oh, okay, well, let's, let's, uh, we need, we need to know what's going on there. And he, he thinks, well, perhaps if I go to the academy, I've been looking, I've been hoping to get in touch with them because, you know, they, they, they teach magic there. That could be useful. Um, uh, so Alden decides that he's going to go on to the academy on his own whilst. Carlos and Ashbourne do something else and I can't remember what they did but that doesn't matter for the moment for the moment let's focus on Alden he goes to the academy and he <laughs> he he arrives and uh, he is admitted but with like a, a slightly strange look he he realizes he he's like it's like some you just wandering into like one of the most prestigious colleges or universities in the world like he just wanders in <laughs> into like the inner halls of the place and people are like watching him go by and eventually he arrives at this like great sort of atrium where he is m greeted by a steward there uh, and let's see oh where's it gone I had it right here. Here we are, the Academy. He says, uh, may I help you? And Alder says, yeah, I'm just hoping to just look around, really, and um, I'm hoping to access some information within here. What information would you like? And he says, well, let's start with some basic information about the Academy. I'd love to learn know more about it. And the steward's like, I'm not, a, I'm not a tour guide, but he, he sort of sighs and rolls his eyes and says, fine. The Academy is divided into seven schools of magic. 
or is it eight? <laughs> I think it's eight actually. But uh, each school is uh, is a separate discipline that requires intense study to master. As master Ruhr of the school of abjuration, as master Vorder of the school of conjuration, master Helio of the school of enchantment, master Ulrich of the, the school of evocation. There's master Unway, the master of illusion. There is master Eldwin, the master of the universal magic, and master Nudak. The master of transmutation. There is also Grand Master Ixar, who is uh, presides over all of them, and he's like, "Wow, <laughs> you, you know all their names." And he was like, "I have them written in the prep." <laughs> um, and he's like, "Well, I'd really like to gain access to your library. I'd love to learn more about uh, the history of this place. Really, I'd love to learn the history of Landfall in particular." And he says, "Well." anyone can really become a student however uh, you need not only a sponsor to sort of vouch for your position in the academy but you also and he sort of looks him up and down as if to say you need a lot of money that I'm pretty sure you don't have and he says tuition begins at 9,000 gold pieces a year <laughs> and Alden is like what? and he's like yes and you see like a curl come to the side of the steward's mouth you heard me. I said 9,000 gold pieces a year. Student loans, everyone. <laughs> Student loans. I love bringing reality into fantasy, you know. It's just one of the many uh, burdens we bear in real life and we bring it crashing into our escapism. Cheers. <laughs> saying cheers because it's rum and coke not a beer person but I was a punk in the 80s and I don't know that many of my friends would be would be good tasting but, mm. I see what I see what you mean I get it because I'm drinking punk IPA I'm very slow I understand what you were saying and that is funny. <laughs> right. Anyway, all that to say, Alder's like, I don't have that money. And so the, 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 the steward's like, well, then you don't have the right to access the library. And Alden sort of like goes, oh, I really need to get in there. And he says, right, I'll be back. And he turns and he's about to leave when he bumps into someone and he goes, oh, I'm so sorry. And as he looks up, his eyes meet with a woman's. The same woman who had cast the spell that had brought the caves down upon them in Sky Cleave. The same woman who had been part of that rival adventuring team uh, within the vault of elven knowledge and had tried to kill them. Alden is absolutely like fro he's frozen for a second and then he's like reaching for his sword uh, and this woman says I will explain everything let's talk and Alden's like I don't know if I want to talk to you you tried to kill us you tried to kill me and my friends yes I know that but it wouldn't do well for us to Respark that conflict right here, right now. And I said, and I was like, well, why not? Why not? You should be. You're a student here. And he's like, yes. Just, just let's go and talk somewhere else. Perhaps there's an arrangement we can come to. And he's like, fine. And they go to like a, a dark corner. And he says, well, he says, firstly, she says, my name's Valper. Who are you? I'm Alden, and I don't see why that should matter. Why do you want to know my name? You were trying to blast us to pieces with a spell. Not but a couple of days ago. So yes, well, uh, I was in a bit of a bad situation. I went along with those people because I needed protection to access Skycleave. I wanted to find out more information about the ancient elves. And I thought you were trying to kill us, which in fairness, you were trying to, you were trying to kill us. You were trying to kill us. Yeah, but you were trying to kill us as well. And they never sort of like a back and forth, like who was trying to kill each other first. Um, 
And she's all right, fine, fine. Let me let me make it up to you, okay? How about you forget that you ever saw me in Skycleave, and I'll I'll I don't know why are you here anyway. I'm trying to access the Great Library. Well, why didn't you say so? She said. I will get you access to the library, and in return, you keep Stum. Olin was like, deal. So, she leads him into the uh, into the great library, and there, Alden is able to begin his research, and he does that for some time. Um, I wish I could remember what um, Alden and Carlos were doing at this time, because I remember we were jump jumping back and forth between them. Let me just quickly consult the notes. Oh, no, I think they actually just went back into Landfall. They went back into Landfall. So whilst he was doing this, those two were buying supplies. And I think Alden gave them a bit of cash so they could get him some stuff as well. So they went and bought potions. They bought equipment and stuff. They sold some stuff that they found in Skycleave. Um, they had some cool magic items by now. I don't think I mentioned... I mentioned it in the in the campaign journal videos, but seeing as I'm sort of like rehashing it into this, let me just say very quickly again. In the Deep Window dungeon, they found a pair of mirrors where... Uh, the spell mirrors, whereby you can cast a spell into one mirror and it comes out the other. So it's kind of like a... sort of like a portal, a spell portal, effectively. Um, which they've been making good use of. Not only... Oh, that's the other thing. They can also look at one mirror and see out the other. And they can also fire spells into one end and it come out the other end. It's quite a nice little magic item that I came up with that I was quite pleased with. Um, and, yeah, like I said, they had that spell ring that I mentioned before. So they're off selling and they're off, like, getting equipment and stuff whilst Alden's doing this research. <clears throat> so we cut back to Alden and he has discovered a tome that details information about the Tomb of the Founders. And in doing so, he learns about the Founders. The fa one founder, the leader of the Founders in particular, was a man named Arthas. Arthas the Explorer, a legendary figure in the, uh, the mythology of our world. Arthas was the one who sailed across the, uh, the oceans. He departed from, uh, from Main Realm and he sailed east until he found this place and there are various reasons <coughs> uh, that you know, why he did this some people just thought he was off to you know, find new frontiers other people suggested that Arthas went um, because he foresaw like a great enemy uh, that would approach from the east and he wanted to head it off they say he had like uh, a visions of a great evil and that he evoked the gods themselves to help him in their plight across the water. And it is said that none of the gods answered to help him in this plight. At least none of the good ones. Uh, Alden is looking deeper and deeper and deeper into this uh, into this, uh, this figure, this Arthas. And indeed, Arthas the Explorer is buried in the Tomb of the Founders. Uh, and that is beneath Castle Rookspire itself. And he looks out of the window of the academy and he, he can see Castle Rookspire from where he is. It's just this vast citadel at the centre of um, at the centre of Landfall. There's just this rising battlements, this in, in, impossibly tall tower uh, towers and walls and stuff. Um, and that is like the main structure that was, you know, main defensive structure of the uh, of the city. Built upon the bones of elven civilization, as Nicurian has suggested uh, well, last time. So, <clears throat> thinking, well, he thinks, well, I, at least I know where it is, but uh, now I need to know how to get there. Like, I don't imagine they're just going to let me walk in, he's thinking to himself. Um... And uh, he uh, he actually like looks into it and he says, "Well, the the the, the tombs it's, itself, yeah, like I said, beneath um, beneath Castle Rookspire." But he thinks and he remembers uh, the words of Knight Captain Dask uh, when they were doing that mission for him, uh, disbanding the um, the Denarchs 
uh, Knaves Leave operation. And he'd explained that there was this undercity uh, that operated within sort of like the subterranean ruins of the city. Um, and he thought, there's a whole other city beneath the city that we've not even looked into yet. Perhaps, perhaps they'll, they'll know how we can get beneath the citadel, beneath Castle Rooksbyre. So with this in mind, he uneasily thanks Velper and says, we're square, but don't try and kill me again or I'll kill you. And she's like, as if you could. And there's a bit of tension there and eventually he leaves and she is uh, able to keep her secret. Wow. <clears throat> it's quite hard work just constantly talking. <laughs> Yeah. It's um it's fun this. I've been really enjoying this. I've been really looking forward to doing these streams now. Uh I'm really excited with what we've got lined up in the future as well. Uh I've been kindly visited by three of the individuals that will be joining me on this channel very soon. And that is when things are gonna Kick up, kick up a notch because if you're enjoying me talking about these stories it is only because, the only reason I talk about these stories is because it's in lieu of us actually playing out those stories live and that's what we're going to be doing very soon but in the meantime let's get back to the tales so <clears throat> they they meet back up and uh, they agree that they're going to try and enter the team of the founders and uh, they hear a name because they, they sort of like start doing their research as of how they find the uh, the Undercity. And they heard a name in the meeting uh, with the Denark family. I only mentioned it very, very briefly last time. But when they were sneaking around the back of the, uh, the Leaky Tap, which was the tavern under which they were doing the Knaves Leaf operation, there was like a meeting in a function room. <laughs> Uh, and in that function room there were a number of leading criminal uh, people <laughs> criminals, leading criminals uh, that dropped a name Zorda Skullrus who is allegedly the, um, the the leader of the Undercity sort of like, not, well, maybe not even the leader but the, uh, the strongest criminal uh, crime lord that's the word I'm trying to think the strongest crime lord of the Undercity is called Zorda Skullrus and they do some searching and investigation. Eventually, uh, they delve beneath the the uh, into the uh, into the subterranean world of Landfall and discover the Undercity. Um, great, hu huge, like uh, archways of ancient elven structures and stuff now um, pitted in darkness and grime. Um, and. They meet with Zorda Skoras. To their surprise, uh, is a drow, and she, like everyone else <laughs> in a and d campaign, says, Oh, you're coming to me for help? Well, I will scratch your back if you scratch mine. Um, she says, um, I. She's. She says, but I need to sort of know that you're you're worthy of, of this, first of all. Something along those lines. And they say, uh, oh, you know the Denark family? And she says, of course I know the Denark family. Uh, we disbanded their, we destroyed their entire Navy Sleep operation. And she's like, oh, that was you? And they're like, yeah. And she's like, do you have a, do you have a name? Like a, like a group name? Like a, an outfit that we can address you by? And they're like, nope. <laughs> Uh, and um, it's then that I start sort of addressing them as the Outlanders and uh, I hadn't really I don't know, I don't know when it started actually but like it just seemed like a cool thing to call them and eventually it sort of kind of stuck so from now on they're known as the Outlanders and they they kind of think oh we keep being called that, we'll just be the Outlanders you, yeah so okay Outlanders, 
uh, fitting. That's kind of what you are. Um, you are worthy of uh, of of providing a service. What can I do in return? And they explain what well, we need to. We need to go to the tomb of the founders, and she's like, "Oh, you're insane." Uh, I've had many people try and access that tomb, and they're like, "Why?" And she says, "Well, there's." immense amount of hidden treasures that lie lie within but it's it's too dangerous it is guarded by and protected by dark forces um and not only dark forces but um the uh the ancient elders of of landfall clearly understood uh engineering to um an insane degree they they had constructed traps and, uh, and devices of which to stop anyone from entering uh and uh accessing the the hallowed remains of the founders and Alden's all cocking he's like yeah well I haven't I haven't been in there yet and I I'm, I reckon I'll be fine <laughs> uh, and she's like fair enough uh, I'll tell you where it is I can tell you exactly how to get in there uh, I, we, I've sent many people to do that before um, and anyone who has tried to get in there has died but you'd be more than welcome to that information however uh, before I give you that information, I would like you to deal with a problem. Cut to the Outlanders, uh, waist deep in shit, <laughs> as they wade through the sewers of the Undercity, uh, where they are told to find a um, uh, a group of uh, missing uh, members of Zordoscorus' organisation. Uh, and uh, they will know them by like enamel rings or something or something. Like, there's some identifying marks that they can sort of like find out who these people are, who they are or where they are or whatever. And they find these people uh, being slowly digested within the bowels of a gelatinous cube because uh, <laughs> they see these like bodies just floating in the air and they're like, oh my god, what what has happened here? And Carlas runs only to find himself passing into the perfectly clear acidic bulk of a gelatinous cube. Uh, which was terrifying for him, because we thought he was going to die. Uh, gelatinous cubes, obviously, <laughs> uh, they, uh, they're they very much a trap monster. You're not exactly going to get the most um, high-octane battle, in my opinion, against the gelatinous cube, because it's a very slow-moving entity that crawls towards you. And uh, it's good to be used, utilised as a DM as a trap monster. Like, you either, oh, I've fallen through a trap drawer and land in a gelatinous cube, or you walk through some doors and a gelatinous cube falls from the ceiling uh, and lands behind you, now trapping you in a corridor with it slowly moving towards you that kind of thing is what it's used for so for this Stratus cube to be in this awful sewer tunnel filling up the sewer tunnel and then for Carlos to just run straight into it it was pretty bad um, Carlos being the front line guy it was always the one who was taking you know he gave a lot of out damage out but, but at the same time he he took a lot of took a lot of scraps and a lot of scrapes and he, like, he just runs into the Shatter's cube and just and just glides into the <laughs> gelatinous acid uh, and uh, unfortunately it was up to the other two to uh, to get him out and the dreadful thing is is whenever you strike the gelatinous cube as I recall at least in 3.5 uh, the um, yeah it's uh, like you, I think you damn, you hurt yourself if you hit it for example um, with a melee weapon at least a melee weapon if you have a reach weapon like if you have a spear I don't think it does but I don't know it was pretty bad anyway all that to say they appeased Zordos Skullrus uh, they were able to uh, bring back whatever they had started they, they definitely had ret retrieving something for Zordos I can't remember exactly what I haven't got it written in the notes I just checked um, but uh, in return she was able to uh, to tell them where the entrance to the tomb of the founders was, um, and uh, she said she said first of all the tomb of the founders is uh, within the castle itself, and they were like really put out. They were like, oh, <laughs> so we just have to sneak into the castle? She says, you can. That would be suicide, and the Dominion Guard would execute you for trespassing. Uh, but there is another way. 
a way that I've been uh, working on for a long time. Uh, we've made a tunnel that leads to an alternate entrance to the Tomb of the Founders. Uh, you will find yourself, once you follow those directions, breaking through a wall of the tomb. And that will be the way you get in. Because if you if you go through the, uh, the, the actual way, like the way that people would come to pay their respects and lay people to rest and stuff, you would have to make your way through the castle. <laughs> like the very bowels of the castle. And there is no way. There is no way with the amount of troops in there would you ever be able to pull that off. And I was like, oh, I don't know about that. I think I could give it a go. And uh, they look at Carlas, who <laughs> just charged headlong into, uh, into a gelatinous cube. Uh, maybe you are, subtle old one, but uh, you are, not all of you are. <laughs> uh, so this is probably your best bet. And they say, well, thank you very much for your assistance order. Uh, good to work with you. And off they go to the two of the founders. And uh, on entering from this passage that's been dug through some sewers, they find it to be uh, pretty wild. So, the entrance to the Tomb of the Founders is in the bottom right-hand corner. It's that corridor that then goes into a three-by-three three square uh, square room. Uh, and this, I have to say, is probably one of my favourite moments, not only of this campaign, but of my uh, my entire experience of Dungeons and Dragons as a whole, and I'll explain why in a moment. And I know it's hard to put a moment on what is your favourite moment ever, but this is up there. <laughs> There's a very good reason why it's up there. It's up there because of hilarity. Because <laughs> they have been warned that dark forces guard this tomb and that is uh, a kind description <laughs> they walk in and they see what looks like these layers of cloth draped upon an altar and uh, they look at it very carefully and um, then this cloth appears to be moving and they're like oh my god it's an animated rug it's an animated rug. No. If it was an animated rug, it would be on the floor and ready to trap them. That's the classic, isn't it? That's what the classic of doing an animated rug trap would be. No, 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 no. For those of you who are un uninitiated, I would like to invite you to Google skin kites. That's right. <laughs> skin kites. Skin of living people <laughs> made manifest into these awful kite like creatures that rise up into the air <laughs> and swoop down upon them. Living, <laughs> sorry, undead skin wrapping about them and trying to choke them to death. <laughs> And they were like, the skin kites. I said, behold, the skin kites. Roll initiative. And they were like, the what? <laughs> um, and they did battle with the skin kites. And the skin kites were awful. They were awful. Uh, they, 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 in fact, can I find a picture of them? Probably not. Uh, not for the stream, anyway. But kindly Google them. Type in skin kites. <laughs> It's pretty bad. They're pretty awful. Yeah, that's a gem from the history of D&D. &D. Uh, anyway, they uh, they have a dreadful battle with the skin kites. It's just funny to say, isn't it? Um, and eventually, they manage to, to stop them. And it takes a lot out of them. And... They were like, whoa, <laughs> that was the first thing that we came across in this place. That's what we found just walking in. What are we going to find deeper in? And to be honest with you, it didn't get much easier for them at all, obviously. It got much, much worse. So uh, 
Oh, I just found the description. So the entry. Uh, an old altar greets any who enter this uh, this area of the tomb. Um, uh, strange fabrics wave uh, from the altar as if under a light breeze. It has been enchanted to bring forth the dead to defend this ancient place. But the years have not been kind to the remains that are bound to it. Swirling from the dark come the skin kites. Uh, so yeah, that was them. They then pass into a different room where they notice that it's a, uh, a gallery and they realise that this is a, a place where uh, a vast amount of riches have been brought. Uh, you know how it is. Ancient treasures being buried with the dead. That sort of thing. Uh, but the two of the founders have treasures that come from their homeland. Uh, because the voyage was too far to bury them back home in Main Realm, they had to be buried in the new world, but they tried to bury them with as much from the old world as possible. So within this gallery, there are great works of art that depict uh, great um, murals and great events that have occurred in throughout Main Realm's history. Um, the original realm of our shared setting. Um, and uh, they look at great collections of paintings from a faraway land known as Main Realm. At the forefront is a massive canvas depicting an impossible peak, a mountain split apart by a vast magical singularity um, uh, which is sort of like a hint towards um, something we'll talk about in the future probably. Uh, it's a big deal. Uh, but for now we'll, we'll just press on because <laughs> otherwise I'll be here talking about that until the end of the stream so uh, at, there, at the far door of this uh, this place there is a uh, there is a it is magically trapped and they get fair warning <laughs> that it is uh, an incredibly dangerous device that is locked with a, a magic trap which if they fail will cast the spell inflict serious wounds which is like a, a 3d8 plus whatever damage I, I was definitely trying to like hammer home to them that this was going to be sort of like uh, Dark Souls slash Tomb of Horrors style dungeon where it's going to be fairly brutal and fairly unforgiving so they could come here whenever they wanted like they know that at the end of this uh, allegedly Ergamax is going to be here this legendary weapon in the Tomb of Arthur's they can come here at any time and they just decide to come here straight away <laughs> rather than going away and getting a bit more experience and so they know they're up against it in here uh, a definite trial by fire so after they've uh, they've inspected this uh, this gallery uh, they discover an illusionary wall uh, and beyond this illusionary wall there is a cave uh, uh, they discovered earlier in the lore Arthur's bid that he would bring part of Main Realm with him. Uh, and there's like a carving as they enter this room and it says, In here lies the land of our fathers before us. Um, at the far end, there, there's just, they basically enter this room that's just filled with just sand. At the far end, there's like a chest. Um, and uh, they, they, don't, they don't trust the, the, uh, they don't trust this sand. Uh, let, hang on, there we are. So you can see in the bottom right-hand corner of this image is the uh, is that cave that was hidden by the illusionary wall. And uh, <laughs> they uh, they were like, mm, "Do we try and cross?" And they thought, "Yeah, let's just go." And they crossed it, and of course. If they're bringing the earth from the old world, then it would make sense that within that earth there was a spirit of an earth elemental, because of course. So they did battle with the great earth elemental, which again was a very difficult challenge. Elementals are always a difficult challenge. Earth elementals hurling great rocks at them, uh, immune to several types of damage. Um, um, have resistance to a lot of damage as well. They're like, wow, this is hard. And I'm like, yes, it is hard. <laughs> I, I warned you it was going to be hard. It is hard. They fight a giant earth elemental and they barely scrape through. And they're like, oh my god, <laughs> this is bad. 
This is bad. We are in this terrible place and we are barely scraping by. But they are rewarded for their uh, their plight and they find something called the Prince of the Storm King. And I don't remember what this was, but apparently the Prince of the Storm King. What do I mean by Prince? They just got designs? <laughs> like, like graphic design prints? I don't know. I don't remember what that was. Hmm. They uh, anyway. They um. <clears throat> they continue onwards. Uh. I maybe I'll try and find out what those are at some point. But I, they they found something in there which gives them a bonus to strength for twenty four hours. So maybe like a potion of, of the storm king or something. Maybe they take something and it gives them that strength bonus for. A, that amount of time. Anyway, they press on, and uh, looking back at the map here, don't know why I keep getting rid of it. There is a, a central room which is sort of like bridged by a narrow walkway with a square in the middle of it. Oh no, that's what it is. Right, the chest. I've just I've just realised. The Prince of the Storm King... This is me working out what happened in this game. It was a while ago, forgive me. Uh, the Prince of the Storm King wasn't in the chest. They just found treasure in the chest. They'll try and find out what they found in that chest later on. The Prince of the Storm King were... There's a great stone book, and you can see that stone book on in the left side of the map. There is a white section there. Now, can I zoom in? No, I can't. Unfortunately, I can't. But there's a white thing there. Now, you probably won't be able to see what it is. But what that is is actually a... Um, a art asset of a great stone book. And in each of the pages of the stone book, there are two big stone handprints. That's what it was. So... The law of this is that uh, once upon a time, the giants that lived in the forest beyond Landfall, the giants that live in the Ainalar, made an alliance with the humans of Landfall. And uh, they said, they gave them this gift, which was the stone book, which was that if you put the, your hands upon this, this book, uh, you would be granted the strength of giants. And that's basically my way of saying, look, if you explore this part of the dungeon, you'll find this thing which will give you a temporary boost to strength. Obviously, it's so big you can't bring it with you, but it is something that will give you a little bit of help in this uh, in this time of need. I forgot about that. I'm quite happy with that. Anyway, they then go into this next section called the Well of Morning, which is that uh, big bit in the middle. Uh, with the uh, yeah the big drop with the bridge that goes over the over it, um, <laughs> and uh, they uh, they look at the walls and they see all in, embedded into the walls are lots and lots of uh, different uh, different tombs uh, and different sarcophaguses and things. And uh, they also see on the far side, I don't know why I keep getting rid of that, actually, I'm just going to leave that, that up there for a moment. On the far side of that, you can see that there's a, a walkway that winds round to a, a stone platform that has uh, four large uh, sarcophaguses and a big glass ball, like a spherical glass ball. Balls of spherical. <laughs> um, and it's uh, as they were sort of halfway across that bridge and making their way towards that, that they realised that they triggered another of the tomb's defences. This time, uh, as the end of the Well of Morning, uh, any of the original gen generation of people that came from Main Realm uh, had leave to be buried here. And here is where they would be guarded by great constructs of metal and magic. And uh, true to that, the shield guardians erupt from uh, their vigil.
and they strike at them with impossible strength and throw javelins with the force of ballistas. So there, the the figures aren't actually there. Unfortunately, I would have deleted them when I took this, uh, whenever it was, when I made this map. But if you look across like, uh, on the far end of the bridge, that's where some of them would have stomped out and literally with the force of a ballista would be like throwing javelins like doom, doom, doom. and like the, the, wherever they would land there would just be like massive explosion of brickwork and dust as these like metal javelins just ex you know just missing them or whatever uh, sometimes they got hit sometimes and they did a lot of damage the shield guardians then advance across the bridge and a desperate battle above this cavernous void um, took place um, and once again constructs are really hard to hurt um, the factotum I should have said like uh, the factotum could do sneak attack damage so it was always like a bit of a pain for him fighting undead and constructs as I remember because you can't critical them in 3.5 um and yeah, they had a really epic fight. They had a, it was a. I remember that one being a really decent fight, to be fair. Um, and they got through it once again by the skin of their teeth. Thankfully, um, Carlos and Ashbourne had done all that, uh, done all that uh, buying beforehand. So they move on. And uh, this is. Uh, <laughs> I was kind of joking about the skin kites being one of my favorite. It is funny, but I wouldn't say it's like. <laughs> it is funny. Uh, but this actually is also one of the prime moments of, the, of this whole campaign for me. <laughs> um, you can see beyond that abyss like uh, drop. By the way, um, on the side of the map, sorry, just a brief. Uh, Losing my, I'm losing my words, ladies and gentlemen. A brief digression. I remembered my, my words. There is a black space on the far right side of the map. That was to put people in if they fell in that hole. <laughs> um, because if they fell in that hole, that would be a problem. Um, <clears throat> and I'm sure they could find a way out, but that was there just in case. <clears throat> anyway. Beyond the uh, the well of morning, uh, is it the well of morning? Yeah, the well of morning. Uh, they then encounter the walk of raiders, and um, so <laughs> Old Zed, like I said, he's kind of the rogue, kind of, and he's looking through, like he's sort of like using that that. Um, spell mirror that I was telling you about earlier to look around corners and stuff and he looks down that corridor and he's like that's a pressure plate that's whole corridor and he looks he managed to look all the way down that corridor I'll bring it up again that long corridor that goes from the middle of the map all the way to the left all of that is one big pressure plate what are we gonna do? And uh, he tries. He, he tries to disable it and fails. And he says, "Right, well, what we'll do is." And he get goes into his pack. And he gets, uh, he gets his uh, his rope, and he ties it around his waist, and he gives Carlas and Ashbourne the end of the rope. And uh, Alden says, "I'm gonna walk through there, and the moment I'm on that pressure plate." It's going to activate something. I want you to pull me back as quickly as possible. And they're like, is that a good idea, Alden? I don't know if that's a good idea. He said, trust me, it'll be fine. This is the only way, unless you just want to walk down there without doing anything to check to see if there's going to be a problem. They're like, no, all right, fair, fair enough. All right, fine. You do what you want to do. So yeah, he ties the rope around himself. Carlas and Ashbourne hold the other end and tentatively uh, Alden edges his way out of that door and then steps onto the corridor long pressure plate and immediately <laughs> immediately 
a gate falls in that narrow corridor, trapping him on the pressure plate. So the pressure plate <laughs> immediately just slams a gate down between him and his friends. So Alden is now got a rope tied around him and that <laughs> rope is now trapped under a gate as, of course, a vast boulder rolls down from on high and begins to thunder towards him. <laughs> whilst he is tied to the gate <laughs> a measure of his own doing and uh you gotta laugh right i mean like of all the of all the things he was trying he was desperately trying to make sure he handled this trap right and he got it completely wrong and i thought it was such an indiana jones moment to trigger a trap and then suddenly realize oh my god i'm tied to this thing <laughs> So quick as a flash, like he he draws his blade, cuts his rope, and then charges down the corridor as this great boulder just tumbles towards him. Uh, I think he managed to spot at the bottom of this place as well, but there was also, it's hard to see there, but there's also a great circular saw at the far end. <laughs> and uh, he realises that that thing has activated as um as he's running towards it so not only has he got this boulder chasing him he's also got this circular serrated blade spinning in front of him uh and what that's there for is effectively to i'll put that down for a second is for uh the boulders that roll down from the trap the 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 corridor what did i call it the car is not the corridor of raiders it's the uh the walk of raiders little nod to the raiders of the lost ark um the boulder rolls and then it gets smashed by the great serrated blade a spinning blade at the bottom and then because the pressure plate has like pushed down the remains of the rock slide into the gaps so you don't see any trace of the debris or anything um so he's running, he's got boulder behind him, serrated blade before him. He rolls, uh, he has to do like a successful reflex save to avoid the, the arc of the blade. Uh, he rolls beneath the blade as it spins out uh, and uh, the boulder then explodes behind him as he, he gets there just in time. It's pretty epic. Uh, really, really awesome standout moment for Alden there actually that because uh, like he <laughs> I just love the fact that like he started from a position of complete disadvantage not only had he triggered the trap but he was tied to the gate <laughs> or at least had a rope that he was tied to trapped beneath the gate um, yeah and he, he was uh, thankfully successful in that place from that end he's then able to disable the trap and the others are able to meet him at the far end and then finally they are there at the entrance to the uh, the main section of the tomb, the the great tomb, uh, in the deepest part of this uh, of this place, and I will explain what they discover in there in a short moment. It's going to take another very very quick break, and I'll be back in a moment. Cue the animatic. It works. Hooray!
and I'm back. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much if you're still with me. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. This is going to be the last section of the Storyteller stream this evening. Um, we'll get back to it. So, as I said, the Outlanders have arrived at the entrance of the Grand Tomb. Or the Great Tomb, or the Big Tomb, or the Last Tomb, whatever you want to call it. They have found it. And there it lies before them. It is the massive room uh, that uh, makes up the top of that map there. That is now on the screen. And uh, as you can see, there is a walkway towards a great uh, platform. And that walkway is flanked by many stone graves. The outlanders climb the stairs and they stand before the great stone sarcophagus of Arthas the founder, Arthas the explorer, Arthas the traveller. Um, and they see etched into the tomb there is a uh, there is a uh, <clears throat> there is a rhyme it says I must go down to the seas again to the lonely sea and sky and all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by and the wheels kick and the winds song and the white sail shaking, a grey mist on the sea's face, and a grey dawn breaking. They, uh, <laughs> they see that effectively Arthur's tomb is not only surrounded by, uh, protected by his faithful followers who came with him across the sea. Uh, he's also protected by ancient, deadly magics. Regardless of this, <laughs> regardless of this, Alden Revelstein, hungry to find the final judgment, hungry to find Urgamax, the blade that will protect him against the forces that threaten him, hurls open the sarcophagus. This is what we're here for, he says. This is why we have come to this place. And he looks into the sarcophagus and he sees there a desiccated body. He sees the remains of Arthas, the explorer, still in brilliant armour, still cloaked and helmed, but a dread skull. Can be seen looking up at them. And... Uh, Upon his chest, clutched in two skeletal hands, is the grip of a great sword. However, Urgmax, though brilliant and probably the most exceptional blade that any of them has ever seen, apart from perhaps Carlas, who is uh, perhaps fonder of his own dragon. Uh, Blade Katana, which we will talk about in the future. Um, yeah, it's an exceptional blade. However, it's shattered. It's um, kind of like a, an inversion of the... Uh, <laughs> not inversion, but like a dark mirroring of uh, the Flame of the West, um, Narsil. Uh, it lies shattered upon him. Uh, it is the hilt and effectively a short sword length of the blade <clears throat> and then three other pieces and Alden looks at it and his jaw drops he has come to this new world he has come to this place beyond uh, the knowledge of most people to find this epic weapon and it's smashed and it's ruined and he will not be able to defend himself with it. Well, 
Maybe you can, he thinks. And he reaches in, <laughs> regardless. Because Alden happens to use a short sword. Uh, and I think it has a rapier and a short sword. I think he sort of... That's me being weird. Uh, <laughs> he dual wields. He has like a rapier and a short sword, I think. So he picks it up and he's like, wow, okay, all right, this works. But it doesn't have the power that I need. It needs the power. It needs the, the final judgment needs its power to help me defend myself against this, uh, this unearthly threat. Uh, and uh, as he takes up the blade, he feels like a terrible burning upon him. A terrible burning upon his chest. Now, if you remember right back to the beginning of the stream, uh, right back to the beginning of this, where I was reading about Alden's, uh, Alden's backstory, the, um, the extra planar threat that he faced uh, left its mark upon him. In fact, let me just go back just so make sure you make sure I've got the uh, the wording correct. Let's see. Uh, in doing so, whether the shade had an ulterior motive or not is still up for debate. The shade left its mark on old and a black talon burned into his flesh uh, with a warning that he'll be back uh, to claim his soul in 18 months. Well, that black talon is burned onto Alden's chest. And that is now burning now, that black talon. And he looks at, looks at, his, looks at his skin and he's, like, he's terrified, absolutely terrified. And then he looks up and in horror, he sees burning through the armor that is upon Arthur the Explorer. He sees that that skeleton, Arthas's remains, bears the same mark. An affinity with this long dead explorer, this long deceased figure of mythology. Horrified, he suddenly hears a voice in his head. which I will now <laughs> read when I find the right part of my notes once again. So he's feeling this burning on his, on his, uh, on his chest and a dreadful voice speaks in his ear and it says, it is no simple chance that you found Urgamax for your salvation. It will hold you to the scale as it did Arthas. It is the final judgment of both the wielder and the foe that it faces. The simple pact of your soul is trivial. This, Alden, is your calling. You must reforge the blade. I bid you to do this not only for yourself, but for the realm of Ash. You may address me as Darkfire. You may have sought this blade to protect yourself from me, but I am now your personal conduit with our shared master who you are unwittingly bound to by right and by pact. The mark on his chest burns more and more and more. And I was like, Master, what master? What master have I bound myself to? And the voice says, You are a master of knowledge and secrets yourself. Who else would it be? Uh, Alden is suddenly gripped by terrible pain. And it's almost as if as he opens his eyes, he sees like a howling black ball of fire, which begins to twist and change into the symbol of the congregation. Now, the congregation is the collective of civilized faith within the realms of the Dominion. It is... 
Um, it is an order, a religious order, that has basically combined all religions under one umbrella. And it changes into that symbol. And that symbol has always been of a hand with an eyeball fused into its palm. Uh, for those of you who know, you know. And for those of you who don't know, <laughs> that is the symbol of Vecna. And all the knows that that is the symbol of Vecna and immediately is absolutely horrified. He has been bidden unwittingly to find this blade to defend himself from the force that would come to claim his soul. <sighs> what he didn't know <clears throat> is that he's actually been guided here this whole time by this presence. This dark fire. It said, you may address me as dark fire. Uh, and as he has taken up Ergamax, uh, the voice says, your first test has come. Uh, the blade's former master will not surrender it so easily. And Alden and the rest of them look down in the coffin and suddenly, to their horror, the eyes of the dread skeleton of Arthas suddenly glow a terrifying white and in horror uh, they prepare themselves in battle as I say roll initiative uh, the faithful followers of Arthas uh, all of those uh, sarcophaguses that uh, surround them uh, that's the wrong one <laughs> just pressing buttons here pressing buttons in the Tomb of the Founders, so let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 30. <laughs> 30 dreaded zombie followers uh, or skeletal followers of uh, Arthas uh, sworn to protect their master even in death rise up 30 of them and turn to face the raised platform uh, Karlash prepares his ejatsu uh, focus whereby he will draw and get like the samurai, the classic samurai draw attack ready. Ashbourne begins like twisting uh, roots out from, out from the ground. He casts entangle and stuff and prepares to defend uh, themselves against this uh, this undead horde. And Alden holds aloft the blade he has travelled uh, months to obtain uh, to use against its former master, the undead Arthas. And they do battle. And by goodness me, it is the most epic battle that has occurred in this campaign so far. Uh, the battle atop Sky Cleave pales in comparison. Um, and uh, it's touch and go for a while. Uh, listen, I can't, I can't say that Carlas uh, did badly in this fight. Carlas, the samurai, absolutely obliterated. Uh, a vast number of the uh, the undead that swept towards him, but he's only he was only one man, and there are a lot of them. Uh, Ashbourne is doing a great job at holding them back with his druidic powers. Uh, I th I'm just thinking about it. Did they bring Snag Tooth with them? I don't think they did actually. I think they might have left him outside. I think they left him outside the city because they were like, we can't bring a... <laughs> That's why they did. They left him outside of the city because they were like, we can't bring a dire weasel into the city. People will be terrified. So he lives in the wilderness outside the city until he gets back out. So Snagtooth is not with them. Not that he could drain zombies anyway, or skeletons anyway. So anyway, that's the battle set up, but the duel, the, whilst all this is going on, it is basically old and the fat totem against Arthas, the undead figure of legend. And it's a, it's a showdown for sure. And Alden is pulling every trick he's got. Like, um, 
he, he's uh, like I've always explained like he's a uh, he's a jack of all trades but a master of none like he's pulling every trick he's got like he throw, he's got throwing knives like he he tries to roll and tumble out of the way of um, uh, Arthur's threat range and then like strike again like he's throwing um, alchemist's fire at him and he's trying to use I think he had holy water as well at one point uh, he's just doing everything he can to basically hold Arthur's back but Arthur's is just too strong. And I'm going to see, actually. I hate to... Sorry if I'm wrestling the, this pa these papers... Papers? These papers, <laughs> these papers into the micro. But I just suddenly realised, I reckon I could probably find Arthur's in here. It's just a shame I didn't think of that before now. Oh, that's frustrating. Probably not. Let's see. Bear with. Because I'd like to, I'd like to be able to tell you exactly what he had. <laughs> Team of the Founders, I found it. Skin Kites, Shield Guardians, Earth Elementals. Nope, that is everything but Arthas. That is a great shame. Why have I not got his stats there? Eh, all right, doesn't matter anyway. They're basically fighting and he... He's using... Um, he was a warrior, so like I think he had like... um. I think he might have had like a Witch King kind of flail actually now I'm kind of thinking of it. No, he... Oh, no, or did he fight him with Ergamax? Did he take him? No, he didn't fight him with Ergamax. He was fighting him with claws and a mace perhaps. Anyway, sorry for the delay. I just want to make sure I get it right because this bit is fairly crucial to what happens next. They're fighting and while Alden is do holding his ground it is fairly plain to see that this figure of myth that bears the same the same branding as him <laughs> branding is like Nike <laughs> he's sponsored they're like as in a brand like he's got the same symbol of the talent upon him the same mark that he has to bear and they have this epic duel but eventually Arthur so it just shows that this guy is this this, uh, this undead warrior is too much for Alden and <laughs> It's just one of those things where things worked out perfectly and you always get this as a, a DM. You're like, I didn't make this happen. <laughs> I promise. I promise I didn't make this happen. Uh, he knocks Alden down uh, and smashes him to uh, belief zero. Uh, for those of you familiar with... 5th edition being knocked down is a little bit different in 3.5 if you've never played it before just to explain it's a lot more brutal in 3.5 basically if you drop below 0 you are unconscious and every round you've got to try and stabilise otherwise you drop uh, to minus 1, 2, 3, 4 so say for example you get hit with the amount of damage that knocks you to you can just be killed outright if there's enough damage done to you, for example. Alden was knocked to, like, minus five or something. He was hit, and the damage took him to minus five. If you get to minus ten, you're dead. That's it. Okay, there's no death saving throw. Uh, it's either you stabilise, which is a 10% roll, <laughs> or you're done, or you get healed by someone else. Anyway, all I have to say... Arthur's Explorer smashes Old through Alden's defences. He's smashing him with this mace again and again and again. Alden's defences break. He falls to the ground. Arthas um, takes up Ergamax from um, Alden's uh, fallen form. And he lifts it on high. And it's almost like the, the, the sword itself has a ghost of where the rest of the blade should be. And he just flips it, inverts the grip, and just slams the blade into Alden's chest, straight into the talon mark that is that he bears there. And Alden gives out a terrible cry and is slain. <laughs> um And that is where we learn about Ergamax's abilities. Ergamax is effectively a soul drinker. 
uh, whereby when you kill a foe, the soul of the the victim forms into the blade. Um, and that <laughs> is where I'm going to leave the story, I think. I was going to go a bit more, but I'm thinking... I think we're about two and a half hours in. That's a good place to leave it. Uh, yeah, effectively, like, Alden's come out all, all this way to get this blade to protect himself against this evil, only to be told that this evil has guided him here <laughs> to reclaim this blade only for the previous wielder to defeat him in single combat and then plunge the spectral remains of the blade into him. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably a good place to leave it. Um, and it's a hell of, it was a hell of a session. I remember, I remember everyone just being sort of a bit dumbfounded and they're like, "Oh my goodness!" And I didn't expect to, uh, I didn't expect to for that to happen so much. But you've kind of got to just, you kind of just got to go with it. If I, I didn't want to kill him. But at the same time, you gotta go with the dice. You gotta go with the dice. Thankfully, there is more to this situation than meets the eye, but we shall explain about that next time. We shall talk about that next time. Uh, something I'm very excited to do. Um, yeah, I think that's a good time to, a good place to leave it. Um, so, uh, Thank you ever so much for those of you who uh, dropped in live. I really, really appreciate it. Um, it does mean the world. And I'm dead excited. <laughs> I know I keep saying it. I'm dead excited for what's gonna, what's coming up. Like me sitting here and doing this storytelling stream, as much as I enjoy it, this is not why I've come to Twitch. Um, I'm just doing this because I want to sort of establish some content on Twitch before before the games begin and my goodness me what games they will be uh, the uh, yeah my uh, my good friends who were dropping in into the chat Craig was here before Matt was here before Don was here before um, they're they're gonna they're gonna blow your minds they will blow your minds and they will be playing on this channel uh, when the, our current campaign will draw to a close. Maybe even sooner, actually, depending. We shall see. But man, these are exciting times. These are exciting times for the performance check, and it's only going to get better. Uh, but for the meantime, until that time comes, I'm just going to keep going on the Storyteller stream. I'm really enjoying this as well. Uh, that, let me see. We didn't actually get through that many sessions this time. I spent quite a long time on on that. But that was like a fairly... That's one of the crucial moments of the whole campaign, actually. Because it's introduced the fact that um, Alden <coughs> has sort of like this antagonistic bond with Vecna now. Um... And this spirit, this dark fire that sort of like uh, has guided him here, uh, which is like that's a big. I didn't realize it was going to be as big as it was in, in contribution to the campaign, but it re that that aspect in particular developed considerably from what I had uh, initially thought it would do. Uh, let me see. So them battling. <laughs> them battling uh, Arthas was the conclusion of the seventh session I think so yeah there's still a lot to go and it's interesting because obviously more things some, sometimes more things happen in a session than others everyone who plays D&D knows that um, so yeah we'll probably make a bit more headway next stream but there we are I'm just rambling now anyway I'm gonna call it there. Thank you ever so much for those who came to uh, hang out with me live. I really appreciate it. Um, if you can, if you're watching this either on Twitch or YouTube, please subscribe. Please follow on Twitch because I promise you, when I start running games on this channel, it's gonna be it's gonna be amazing. 
it really will be and I'm, I'm so excited some of the stuff that we've been working on in terms of the overlays that are going to be on here in terms of the production of it it's going to be maps you're going to be able to see what the players see um, yeah it's going to be it's going to be out as well uh, and into the next uh, so yeah please follow please subscribe thank you ever so much for watching and I hope that all of your performances are up to standard and I should have uh, hit stop <laughs> For the last time, cue the animatic. Goodbye. Thanks for watching.